Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. Last week we looked at first capital reach, and this week we're going to look at the cannabis industry again, this time in California under Subversive Capital, which is a SPAC. So, a lot of information to dive into. I'm going to go fairly quicker than normal, mainly because the financials aren't as great to dive into, uh, given it's just becoming a real merged entity next week. So I wanted to get this video out before then. The company has been on my radar for a little bit. I should disclose I do own the company and I still own the other ones we talked about on the Columbia Care video we did a while ago. So I have a small position in Subversive Capital. I will go through the reasons why, what I like about the company, what I don't like, and the risks. And then also just to show that the cannabis industry isn't anything new for me to dive into. Um, I still have Green Thumb Exposure, True Leaf Exposure, Cure Leaf Exposure, and Columbia Care Exposure. So overall, decent exposure to the U.S. Cannibal ma cannabis market. <laughs> cannibal market. <laughs> this company, like I said, doesn't have the history of the financials, so it doesn't have the same amount of confidence in their ability to scale yet. So that's why I didn't put as much of my current uh, asset base into this company. And I'm also not sure how management thinks about tackling, say, New York, for example and how they think about, say, Georgia now flipping the Senate. That should expedite, well, we saw kind of the rally in cannabis companies, like how that should accelerate cheaper access to capital, which technically this company is well capitalized. We'll go through that in a bit, which is one of the things I like about it. So anyway, you can see their brands. There's quite a few. Um, some of you guys might know Monogram, which is a premium product for Jay-Z. He was connected to this uh, SPAC. Uh, really connected already through Kaliva. And has been for some time and then you also notice left close ventures so those two are the main ones they talk about the most Delhi is more of their value product so will be lower margin but probably high volume and then you have rock nation which most of you guys are familiar about the influencers you get people and actually create brand awareness and create the premium product and at a price people are willing to pay for a brand right that's how you decommoditize a commodity anyway so their strategy is Fairly interesting. Basically, they have their Kaliva, so from the cultivation side, they want to own the whole vertical chain. Um, that's nothing new. In fact, in some states, it's actually required. <laughs> California is kind of like the wild west of cannabis, in my mind. Um, I mean, Oregon could be kind of the same. There's less structure, which makes it harder to win for a business because you're competing with the black market, which is not being addressed in California. And I want to say, Three years ago, I heard the strategy before of creating the brand, whoever wins California will win America. And so far, no brand has won in California. Not even these brands. Even though they'll say that they're the highest or have the greatest market share. We'll go through that in a second. But just want to point out the opportunity in California is still there, and no one has technically won California. Obviously, they're diversifying their product base. That's pretty standard. And they have wholesale, wholesale and direct-to-consumer. Currently, most of their revenue is actually wholesale, which is important in an asset light business model, <laughs> especially if you're trying to become the biggest well-known brand. You want your product in every store you can, even if you own, own it or not. So that actually makes sense to me. Though ultimately, whenever you see wholesale, you see lower gross margin because the retailer needs to make money on it too. The omnichannel expansion, really, it's going to be fueled by both delivery and store count. They don't have that of aggressive retail uh, growth. I think they have three stores and they're going to 15 stores. How are the revenue numbers going to be like, well, how are they doing that decent amount of revenue, right? And a part of that is the wholesale right, through the different other retailers they don't own. <laughs> so it's interesting, interesting idea. Delivery is going to be their main source of growth. And we'll break that out a bit. Jay-Z, so that's what most people will know or they should know if they're doing their job, <laughs> uh, is tied to this uh company and tied to certain products that they're going to be pushing out there we should attract a higher premium and therefore a higher gross margin and most importantly protect the gross margin and they also have rock nation tied to that and again they say here 150 top artists and a lot of followers so 1.5 billion in the population <laughs> and the eight here you're, uh, you're looking pretty good so the california formula strategy aggressive m a so they're going to try to consolidate parts of California that they like. 
I think that's going to be a reason for growth because of the SPAC money they've gotten. So it's not a small amount, it's more than half a billion dollars. And so they're going to be acquiring probably the best either brands or retailers that they can. And more importantly, with the acceleration with the, the Senate flipping this week, I think they might have opportunities in New York. And that's not literally what I would put the money. It'd be kind of funny because they raised the money in New York, and went to California and found all these companies and put them together. <laughs> uh, they just go back and invest in New York. But that's what I would be looking at if I was this company right now, looking at M&A. And then five, the robust brand. And that's another standard thing. They're going to try to have different brand and price accordingly for every uh, area. This is the page most people see. So you can see they're targeting 185 million at the end of 2020. So that's already passed. And that's not a small amount. We'll see how that ranks up in a little bit at the end. They claim 20% market share in California, which is quite high for California. Again, though, that doesn't keep it intact the black market, which you don't have any data on because it's the black market. So the industry is fragmented and it's very fragmented. So top 10 brands make up less than 30% of sales. That's unique. <laughs> especially in a industry like California which has been legal for some time so there's no clear winner yet no single brand has over single digit market share so that means no single brand has more than 10% of sales so that's very divided so there's a lot but California is still up in the air so part of the reason why it's still up in the air is because the regulatory environment is crap so this is their vertical integration chart basically it says every middleman gets a cut <laughs> that's what this left column tells me so and the most margin, well, there's actually a decent amount in extraction and a decent amount in retail in California. And here, they make the argument if they own the whole chain, they can make more money. And more importantly, the end price to the consumer is less. In this case, 20% discount in our example. So that's part of the value proposition of owning the whole vertical chain. And again, here's their brand map. So they literally, here are the brands they have. We're going to plop them on a map. And this is what they're going to target. So higher end premium products, lower end value products, cannabis enthusiasts, and then mainstream people just walk in the store. Not sure what they want. So anyway, they're trying ultimately the more margin is going to be up here and the less margin is going to be down here. Though from a volume perspective, they'll try to push these out, right? Because if they get these in the doors, they're likely to get these ones in the doors. Here you can see their growth trajectory and like almost every company, it's up and to the right. <laughs> um, here, more importantly though, is the wholesale, the importance of it currently, you can see that that's $143 million of their 185. So it relies on bulk wholesale and branded wholesale. The bulk wholesale is pretty competitive, so you would expect the margins to be lower, whereas retail, you'd expect the margins to be higher and delivery, I'm up in the air on. I mean, if you follow truly, you'd be like, well, delivery, it's hard to make money. You need a lot of houses on a delivery route to make a decent amount of money at scale. So this one, like, and you can see the growth is explosive for delivery, right? 4x and then another 3x on top, going from literally 10x in two years. That's their main source of growth. And retail as well is also a big one, right? Going double and then doubling again. And branded wholesale is also picking up quite a bit. Whereas they have their bulk wholesale actually decreasing, which technically should mean higher market <laughs> if they can do it at scale. One of the things that's nice about California and where the locations they're targeting is that there's high density, which means that if you're making a route to maximize earnings and you have all these people that want your product, you would be more likely to be able to get that scale quicker, right? You have to drive as far to get as many dots connected on your route. So I actually like that, that they're focusing on those Los Angeles Bay Area and Central Valley, and San Diego. And you can see their, their growth trajectory is really, you can see delivery going quite a bit initially. And then retail ramping up, right? You got three stores to 15 by the end of Q2 2022. And again, these aren't big amount of stores for this type of dollar volume they're attracting, right? But again, a part of that is the asset light model because they're currently relying on wholesale for quite a lot of their sales. Actually, currently the majority amount of their sales. And I do like the asset light model, partly because there might be assets that become capital assets that become redundant over time with competition increasing. And eventually there is going to be uh, federal legalization. Yeah, you can see the rollout in specific areas, specifically these four areas, Central Valley, San Diego, Los Angeles, and the Bay Area. So that's their growth trajectory and where they're seeing the growth and where they're allocating their resources to. The growth profit, again, the hockey stick up, 
adjusted EBITDA, but they're not expecting to make money at the end of this current year we just finished. They're expecting positive adjusted EBITDA in 2021. Again, there's talking about the shift to direct consumer with focus on own brands. And yeah, that, that should increase gross margin and EBITDA for unit of sale. And then they're going to use the cash basically from the SPAC to capitalize on consolidating, consolidating California. And now it'll be interesting to see what they use the money for because $500 million might not sound like too much. But in this industry, <clears throat> that's capital intensive to start with, especially out east. It's important right now. And the cost of capital is not cheap because the federal government has still maintained that this is illegal. So it'll be interesting to see where they put these resources to. The management team, a lot of people look at the management team and have an opinion on them. I don't know any of these guys. <laughs> I do like to see who they decided because it's a SPAC. They clearly put people together, packaging it, making it into a company, right? Taking it public. So uh, you have the CEO of Cleva taking the CEO of this company, Diversa Capital. And you also have the COO of Cleva taking over as CEO. You have the CFO of West Coast. And of course, you have the chief visionary officer that the media has picked up on, Jay Z, John Carter. So it's an interesting group of people, but again, I don't know them, so I can't comment on it. So what I don't like, like I like the story, the asset light model, um, the growth and shift to retail and direct to consumer versus the wholesale. Um, though, I mean, if you're trying to build a brand, you're going to want it in the most stores you can, so wholesale makes sense. You can't just get rid of it. <laughs> Their balance sheets so consolidated at the end of September 30th anyway, so just that cross section. And you can see that the main source of assets is the cash injection from the SPAC, 582 million. Everything else relative to that is relatively small. Cash on hand is okay. Inventory standard, like 21 million. Not big in the context that they're selling 185 million a year. Traditional debt is usually not high for companies that are in cannabis because they literally can't get traditional debt. <laughs> and usually they can't, and if they do, the interest rate's very high. At least that's been the case up until this point. Line of credit, so that's your traditional. Yeah, and you have the most table and left coast ventures and convertible most table. So, but in the context, that's only 50 million in debt, and they're making 180 million a year in revenue. So, it's still low. Um, what else? The goodwill, so the intangibles aren't bad, which is what I like. Relative to their size, that means they grew organically, which means they had to fight for their current revenue in California. And California, like I said, hasn't been easy. I kind of view California in my head like an arena <laughs> for cannabis companies that is. The rules are black, and you're confiding with people that don't have to fight for the same rules, the black market. So anyway, I view it if you're able to get traction in California, you're, you're doing something right. So that's one of the reasons why I like the company and why I bought into it. But the financials themselves, like asset, or the balance sheet, fine. Revenue, so this is year-end 2019, so this is year-ago data. And you can see their revenue is only $107 million. They just, their estimate for the end of 2020 was 185 million so they are growing quite a bit almost 100 percent year over year or 80, it's basically 80 percent year over year however you're going to see cost of sales is still really high relative to the revenue so they're not making very much money part of that here is wholesale focus right i would imagine 2019 is even more wholesale focus than 2020 was and california is in an easy market you can see here Khalifa. They have 56 million in revenue, but they incurred 67 million in DNA. How are you going to make money there? So, backward looking 2019, I wouldn't touch this company just based on that, right? That just reminds me of the MedMen mentality to spend what you can to get eyeballs and marketing out there so people buy your product and try to become the best brand in the world. Right? That was the MedMen strategy and it blew up because they just spent too much too fast on shareholders' money. <laughs> not their own, it's not like they could generate money because they're not operating with cash flow. Anyway, 2019 company doesn't look great. Like they literally made 100 million in revenue and lost 91 million before other expenses. <laughs> um, the current nine months year to date, so not the complete year end that we just finished. You can see they're at 148 and they're estimating 185. I don't like that either. Because technically, if it's three months, why are you estimating 185 when you're at 150? Which means your growth rate actually slowed in Q4. However, one of the things I like about it is that we're starting to see the uh, GNA starting to go down relative to the revenue. So that 
would suggest scale, but the thing that's hard with this, as opposed to the Green Thumb and Julie, who actually did see scale, and that's why I'm in them, and why I'm in Curaleaf, and why I got excited and got into Columbia Care, is because I started to see scale, and it's easy to see it on quarterly information, right? But for this company, because they're just new, and they're just literally consolidating a bunch of companies together, um, it's harder for me to see scale yet, so that's why I haven't put as much money in. Though, again, I'm going to get in before the SPAC eSPAC, which is next week. And I also think the brand awareness should be there with Jay-Z backing it. And if that theory proves out to be true, then you do want to be invested in whatever the top brand in cannabis becomes in America. So then, well, they own 20% of the market share. That means, technically, this company is one of the top brands. That's the only one that I could think of that has a similar wholesale strategy is purely for select but again you don't know what brands are going to take off until they do so here we can see uh, revenue starting to pick up a little bit versus the prior year and specifically the wholesale side so sisu went from 30 million in 2019 to 80 million just in nine months to the date so that actually had quite a lot of growth and the other two had growth as well importantly you're going to see uh west coast ventures actually had revenue higher than their cost of sales in the Netherlands trading. So that's good. So again, it's a little benchmark to set, but it is showing they're starting to scale. And more importantly, their GNA is staying at a similar rate while the revenue is growing. And you can see of the three business lines, currently the only one making money is the farming. <laughs> farming business, the wholesale. So while they made 150 million in the nine months, they've lost six million to the four other items. So technically, from backward-looking financials, the company isn't great relative to the other ones, but it is trying to become great, and the presentation, the strategy looks smart. So I do like that. So this is yesterday's news. Today is January 9th, 2021. So anyway, they offered an upside, so that's one of the reasons why I bought in when I did, which is yesterday, <laughs> is uh, basically this upside kind of usually tells you that there's going to be a short-term demand well, and that's not always true, so it's hard for me to say that, but usually it tells me people want to own this company. And in this type of world we're in, where groupthink is all too real, it makes me excited because they can quickly to sell the story to other people. And you can see 70% upside, so this isn't huge. It, I mean, it's a decent amount. They're just getting more cash in this to make their M&A deals and grow, right? The more cash they get, the more they grow. And the more it supports the brand and the scale. And more importantly, you can see that they're getting names and then DJ Khalid and Rihanna, right? And who are not, again, small. <laughs> so they have a lot of followers. Like, so I think this is a good thing. It shows me that people are interested and they're trying to get in for the D spec. Importantly, MSOS, so the ETF for American marijuana companies, also picked up SPAC. I think it's about 2% of the weighting right now. So how it sits versus the other ones that we own, like I already showed you, I own Curaleaf, I own Green Thumb, and I own True Leaf, and I own Columbia Care now. So it fits right in this slot with uh, Columbia Care and Air Strategies currently. So the growth trajectory is different. So it might not be as high as a grower because it's fighting tooth and nail in California, whereas this one, these growth rates tend to go with the states that they're in. If a new state opens, you're going to see the growth rate shoot up temporarily and then it'll come back down a bit and then the next one opens, it shoots back up again. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. So, I mean, like, for example, Cresco and Green Thumb, Cure Leaf, yeah, the Illinois this whole year for 2020, which was amazing for the company, so that's what we wanted to see and it proved proof of concept of scale, which is already proved once by Trulies in Florida. So it just reinforced, okay, yeah, this is a real business. With real margins. Currently, this company doesn't have that backward looking. So that's why um, I didn't want to put as much in because backward looking it looks not as good as the other ones. Though it is technically showing scale, it's still losing a lot of money. So yeah, currently the SPAC hasn't moved much. It's still around 10 bucks. I think I'm in at 10.17. So I'd like to know your thoughts on it. It's, I want to do a quicker video on cannabis today, <laughs> mainly because it's time sensitive with Georgia coming out and then you got this SPAC literally de-spacking pretty quick here. So anyway, have a have a great rest of your week.